Dental Practice Risk Management Through Regulatory Compliance, Part 5, Texas State Board of Dental Examiners Rule 108.6, Understanding How and When to Make a Report of Patient Death or Injury Requiring Hospitalization. Hello, my name is Boyd Shepard and I am a Director of the Professional Resources Center in the PACE Center Office of the Dean here at the University of Texas Health Science Center, University of Texas School of Dentistry. I am also a clinical associate professor in the Department of General Practice and Dental Public Health. I receive no financial benefits that would create a conflict of interest or restrict my independent judgment with regard to the content of this presentation. At any time while viewing the video streaming course, you can take a break by simply pausing your computer. At the completion of this section, you will be asked to take a short exam in order to complete the requirements for streaming video courses. At the time you will receive instructions regarding taking the exam. Dental Practice Risk Management Through Regulatory Compliance Part 5 TSBDE Rule 108.6 Understanding how and when to make a report of patient death or injury requiring hospitalization. This online course is designed for dental practitioners to gain a greater understanding of the Texas Dental Practice Act and the rules and regulations of the Texas State Board of Dental Examiners, specifically TSBDE Rule 108.6, understanding how and when to make a report of patient death or injury requiring hospitalization, so that they may implement the appropriate changes and systems in their day-to-day -day practice that ensures regulatory compliance with these rules and laws. Through understanding and implementation, the participant will also be managing the risks inherent in modern dental practice. Upon completion of this course, the participant will review, understand, and be able to apply the relevant provisions of the Texas Dental Practice Act and the TSBDE rules and regulations. Be able to apply TSBDE Rule 108.6, understanding how and when to make a report of patient death or injury requiring hospitalization, the focus of this presentation. Value ethical and legal approaches to clinical dentistry in your own practice. And review and implement the risk management procedures and protocols that will prevent patient complaints to the TSBDE. Okay, let's get started. Dental Practice Risk Management Through Regulatory Compliance Part 5. Texas State Board of Dental Examiners Rule 108.6, Understanding How and When to Make a Report of Patient Death or Injury Requiring Hospitalization. As a review, please understand that the Texas State Board of Dental Examiners performs three primary functions. Licensing of dentists and dental hygienists the annual registration of all dentists, hygienists, and labs, and enforcement of Texas laws regulating the practice of dentistry. So, where in the world do you find the rules? And we're speaking of the rules and regulations, as well as the Dental Practice Act, all of which comprise and are part of the law that governs and regulates the licensure of Texas dentists, dental hygienists, and the registration of labs. 
you can find these rules at the website for the Texas State Board of Dental Examiners at this web URL. Or simply Google search for the words Texas Dental Board or Texas Board Dental. Either way, it will be the first link in the search. It is important to bookmark and keep this information and have quick and easy access to this information. This again is the law that regulates your license. At this website you will have access to the full Dental Practice Act in Texas, the Texas Administrative Code which is where you will find the Texas State Board of Dental Examiners rules and regulations. You can also find the board's policy statements including and the best example of which is the statement with regard to the use of Botox in the dental office. You will also find the answers to frequently asked questions that are received by the board often as well as helpful and useful forms that the board recommends for use in your office or for reporting information back to the State Board of Dental Examiners. However, please caution, new rules are always being proposed without notice to you. This is another reason to bookmark and check back to the State Board website as often as you can. You would also do well to subscribe to the State Board's newsletter at this address. Again, you will receive important and helpful information that will help you in your day-to-day -day dental practice in managing your risks and keeping track of the regulations and law that regulate your license. On the Texas State Board of Dental Examiners website, you can find links that will also show you recent rule proposals. These are rule proposals of rules that are not yet effective or enforceable, but rather rules that may become enforceable at some point once they have gone through the legislative process. Following the proposed rules actually gives you an opportunity to participate in that process and gives you windows of time to comment on proposed rules. You can also find the link to find rules that have been recently adopted. This is important because again rules are being proposed and adopted without notice to you and you need to know what rules are recent so that you can be aware of any rules that may affect your day-to-day -day practice in a significant way. Again, it's very simple method to get to the State Board website. Simply Google Texas Dental Board. There you will find under the laws and rules, not only the Dental Practice Act and the rules, but these recent rule adoptions. But more importantly, for today's purpose, this is where you will find the Texas State Board of Dental Examiner rules. They're in two different formats, whichever is easier for you to navigate. When you click on the link for the State Board rules, it will take you to the area in which we will be studying today, Chapter 108, Professional Conduct. When you click the link for Professional Conduct, you will then be taken to this page, which shows you the subchapters of Chapter 108. We will be in Subchapter A, Professional Responsibility, and when you click Subchapter A, Professional Responsibility, you will be taken to this page, which gives you the list of all of the rules that are within Chapter 108, Subchapter A for Professional Conduct, Professional Responsibility. 
Our subject today, again, is Rule 108.6, Report of Patient Death or Injury Requiring Hospitalization. When you click this link, the Rule 108.6 link, you will be taken to the full context or full text of the rule. It is laid out and also shows you at the bottom the source note which shows you when it became effective law and any amendments that have occurred since the rule became effective. Although the State Board provides a form online for reporting death or hospitalization pursuant to Rule 108.6, nothing in the rules obligates you to use this form. Therefore, you are advised to seek legal counsel prior to sending the State Board any information. Using the online form is not a guarantee of compliance and you may have other violations in your record keeping or treatment process. Rule 108.6, Report of Death or Injury Requiring Hospitalization. A dentist must submit a written report to the State Board of Dental Examiners as provided below. A dentist must submit a written report to the State Board of Dental Examiners as provided below. Number one, the death of a dental patient which may have occurred as a consequence of the receipt of dental services from the reporting dentist must be reported within 72 hours of the death or such time as the dentist becomes aware or reasonably should have become aware of the death. Looking at this particular part of Rule 108.6 subpart 1 in more detail, Let's break down each element. This particular part of the rule is talking about the death of a dental patient, which obviously we hope never occurs. The rule states that the death of a dental patient, which may have occurred as a consequence of the receipt of dental services, must be submitted in a written report to the State Board and you must, it must be reported within 72 hours of the death or such time as the dentist becomes aware or reasonably should have become aware of the death. As you can imagine, sometimes dentists may be aware of the death of a dental patient within the 72 hour window. However, it is also imaginable that a patient could pass and die uh, without the dentist being aware of it for a number of days, weeks, or even months. It would be important to know the date of the death relative to the date of the last appointment with the dentist. This will be your starting point. How do you calculate whether or not there is a time window of the death relative to the last date of treatment in your office. That will then take you to the next step of determining whether or not the death may have occurred as a consequence of the receipt of dental services. So the language may have occurred is really the trigger in this rule. You have to determine through just scientific application, through clinical observation, through progress notes, through history, through health history, every resource and every piece of information available to you, including, most importantly, the actual treatment that was rendered to determine whether or not the death of a dental patient may have occurred as a consequence of the receipt of dental services that were received in your office. The best example, or a good example rather, is the example for the medically compromised patient who is on blood pressure and other health medication. 
that undergoes treatment in which a local anesthetic with a vasoconstrictor is utilized and everything goes fine during that treatment. Everything goes fine in the office. The patient gets up, leaves, walks out, makes the appointment uh, before walking out at the desk and then leaves as if there's nothing that's a problem with the dental services. But then it's learned later that within three to four hours of getting home from their dental appointment that the patient passes away. Was this a result or could it have occurred or may have occurred uh, as a consequence of the receipt of dental services? Could there be any connection between uh, the uh, anesthesia that was used or anything about the dental procedure that led to a subsequent death of a patient within three to four hours of an appointment? This is the type of information that you'll have to determine and analyze and evaluate particularly the the risks of any particular drug or anesthetic agent that you use in your office and compare that to the health history and the uh, prescription medication that your patient may be on you may have to talk to the medical examiner you may have to talk to the any attending doctors if it's a situation where doctors were available before the death, any piece of information. Once you have all of this information gathered, you will then make a report to the State Board of Dental Examiners, which we'll talk about later in this video. Rule 108.6, Subpart 2, a dentist must submit a written report to the State Board of Dental Examiners as provided below, the hospitalization of a dental patient, as a possible consequence of receiving dental services from the reporting dentist must be reported within 30 days of the hospitalization or such time as the dentist becomes aware of or reasonably should have become aware of the hospitalization. For purposes of this section, hospitalization shall be defined as an examination at a hospital or emergency medical facility that results in an inpatient admission for the purposes of treatment and or monitoring. Let's look at this subpart 2 of Rule 108.6 with respect to hospitalization in more detail. Let's look at each element. This part of the rule is dealing with and addresses reporting to the state board where there is the hospitalization of a dental patient. First of all, it is not uncommon for dental patients to become hospitalized shortly after dental treatment. The question ultimately is in the last sentence which defines hospitalization and it is defined as an examination at a hospital or emergency medical facility that results in an inpatient admission. So if you learn that a patient has gone to the hospital or any emergency room or emergency medical facility shortly after within 24, 48, 72 hours, even within a week after dental treatment and you learn of it and if you believe that it may be a possible consequence of receiving dental, dental services, you will have 30 days to make that report, but you do not have to make that report if, in fact, the patient was not admitted as an inpatient admission for the purpose of treatment or monitoring. If they simply go to the hospital or the emergency facility and they're evaluated, but they are not admitted then the, there is no requirement under this rule to report that hospitalization. Something that's important in both parts of Rule 108.6 is the phrase that says, or such time as the dentist becomes aware of or reasonably should have become aware of the hospitalization here in Part 2 and then back 
in part one, you can see that language again, or such time as the dentist becomes aware or reasonably should have become aware of the death. So going back to subpart two and looking at the similar language, in both parts of the rule, there is a time period defined. For death, it is 72 hours in order to make the report from the time of the death. And then for hospitalization, it is within 30 days of the hospitalization. However, allowing for the chance or the sometimes likelihood that the dentist may not learn of a death or a hospitalization within the prescribed period of time allowed by the rule, both parts of the rule state or such time as the dentist becomes aware of or reasonably should have become aware of, in this case the hospitalization or in the case of death, aware of the death. Why is it in two separate parts? Sometimes the date in which or on which the dentist becomes aware of a hospitalization can be determined absolutely. If it is for an extended period of time after the hospitalization, that is the reason and the purpose and the intent of the add-on language of or reasonably should have become aware of the hospitalization. This is very objective and it allows the board to evaluate the conduct of the dentist in following up after tr a, any particular type of treatment and whether or not the doctor should have followed up, let's say after an extraction or any type of surgery, whether it's oral surgery or periodontics even endodontics, anything that's invasive, did the doctor meet the standard of care? Should they have followed up? And should they have reasonably become aware of the hospitalization or, in the case of death, should they have followed up after treatment? And it, would it have been within the standard of care to do so? And should uh, has there been a period of time that's passed within which the doctor reasonably should have become aware of the death or of the hospitalization. That is the intent of this part of the rule. Subpart 3. Rule 108.6. A dentist must submit a written report to the State Board of Dental Examiners as provided below. In the evaluation of sedation, anesthesia, morbidity, or mortality, the State Board of Dental Examiners shall consider the standard of care necessary to be that applicable to the patient's state of consciousness during the procedure. Looking at this part of the rule, part three of 108.6 in more detail, basically this part of the rule is saying that the state board is going to first look at the patient's state of consciousness during the procedure in order to assess and consider the applicable standard of care that should have been rendered or the level of the standard of care uh, based on that patient's state of consciousness during the procedure. Again, the State Board of Dental Examiners on the State Board of Dental Examiners website has a form for a dentist to self-report patient hospitalization or death. Although the State Board of Dental Examiners provides a form online for reporting death or hospitalization pursuant to Rule 108.6, please note that there is nothing in the rules that obligates you or requires you to use this form. Therefore, you are advised to seek legal counsel prior to sending the State Board of Dental Examiners any information. 
using the online form is not a guarantee of compliance and you may have other violations in your record keeping or treatment processes. This is the reason why you want to get legal counsel. Even though you may, and in my opinion, you are advised to use the form because this is what the State Board outlines as what they will be asking for in any report of death or hospitalization. It is important that because of the broad scope of the use of this form, the broad scope of information that the form is requesting, it will go beyond merely your progress notes related to the treatment in question but it will also ask you about practices in your office, the current status of your CE requirements, the current status of your CPR um, um, compliance, uh, the current status of your emergency plan that's in your office, a whole host of additional information that goes beyond the detailed facts related to a hospitalization or death of a patient. And because of that, because it, the information can be so voluminous for the self-report, um, it is important to make sure that you're not only getting the information to the board in the correct format, but also getting advice on the content that you're sending and whether or not that content is in fact in compliance in and of itself. The importance of this form and filling it out correctly cannot be stressed enough. So let's take a look at this form in more detail. This is the first page of the dentist self-report patient hospitalization mortality or death. Again, this form is available on the State Board website. On the top bar menu, you would look for the link that says dentists, and within that sub box or uh, the box that opens up with all of the sub links, you will see patient hospitalization death report as one of the links or selections within that sub link under dentists. There you will be able to read instructions as well as download this form. This form includes several pages uh, which I'll review with you now. The form starts off with instructions instructing you to complete all applicable fields. Please note that if your self-report is illegible, processing will be delayed and your complaint may be returned to you. So make sure that you fill out the form as legible as possible so that you do not have the form returned back to you. It says that you can email the forms back to the board and it gives you the board's email address to do so. It says to attach all patient records related to this patient with your self-report. See the attached checklist for more detail. Now, this download that's available is eight pages and it gives you a checklist which we will review as well. There are several things that we need to discuss. This first page, when you get past the instructions as well as the restatement of the actual board rule 108.6 there at the top of the form, it then has these blanks that you fill in which is pretty self-explanatory. It says towards the bottom, if this patient was treated in a hospital or emergency care center, provide the following information. And in that instance, then you would want to put in the hospital facility name and the contact information, as well as if there was an emergency medical service, the name of that EMS service and that contact information. Again, the first page has instructions at the top and the, the law is restated and then the blanks that you fill in are very self-explanatory. Make sure then you fill in everything legibly. The second page 
is this big, wide, open, blank space. The instruction at the top says, please clearly summarize the incident resulting in hospitalization or mortality. Enclose copies of all records in your possession related to this patient. I would make a note there. When it says all records related to the patient, the board is looking for exactly that. All records related to the patient, not just progress notes, not just radiographs, but everything including financial information. See the attached records checklist for further detail, which we will discuss in a moment. Please note, if we are unable to read your report, processing will be delayed. A separate narrative or additional pages may be attached if preferred. And then it gives you a place to sign and date at the bottom as well as the contact information in the lower left. The thing that's important to point out about this particular part of the report is that this blank space obviously illustrates the fact that you will be providing some sort of explanation or narrative of what occurred with the patient. I cannot stress enough how highly important it is for you to make sure that you follow the chronology of your progress notes exactly. In other words, your narrative should match the chronology and the descriptions and the treatment that is rendered and recorded in your progress notes exactly. You should not veer off the just completely straightforward description of exactly what happened without any real opinions or any comments towards the patient, but rather stick to the very, very finite and limited explanation that matches up exactly with your progress notes. This again is an area where it would be best and advisable to get legal counsel um, in filling out the report. You don't want to incur additional investigation by your choice of words or lack of words but rather you want to make sure that your statement or narrative or explanation gives the board exactly what they need but in a way that protects you as well. Moving on to the third page of that download, this is then the checklist of required documents. It has instructions. All patient records related to evaluation or treatment of the identified patient must be submitted to the board, including but not limited to the items listed below. Note which records you are submitting and which records you are not submitting. Return the records and this form to the State Board of Dental Examiners with the records. All photocopy documents must be legible. Any document using color-coded text or labels must be submitted in color. A typed transcript must accompany any illegible handwritten notes. English translation of non-English forms must be provided. That is the top section of this particular checklist. It also says, before you get into the checklist, for any item you mark no below, include an explanation on the reverse sides as to why the item was not included in the submission. Now, with the report of death or injury, you would think that it would merely be the report of the death or the injury and nothing else. The board takes the opportunity in the report of a death or an injury to obtain not only your records, which would be relevant, but of several different items that are tacked into this report. The reality is, is that the board is entitled to this information if for no other reason under Rule 108.8, .8, which states that the State Board of Dental Examiners is entitled to records of the patient upon demand and any other information that would assist them in their investigation. And there are other rules that apply in that regard as well. 
So knowing that it is your obligation to comply and to follow this checklist, let's look at each part. You have to have what's called a business records affidavit, which is also included in the forms available on the website. It is required by Rule 107.105 Subpart C. It must be completed by the dentist or the custodian of the records and notarized. Again, this is an important component. It is required. They will not accept the records without the business records affidavit. The form is available and again, you should get legal counsel when filling out these forms. The next several items on the checklist would be all of the items that you would typically find in a patient chart to include number two, patient information sheet, number three, medical history sheet, number four, treatment plan, and it says to include all alternate treatment plans presented. Under Rule 108.8, .8, it is a requirement to have listed not only your treatment plan, but any alternates or options as well. This is a part of record keeping that they are stating should be included in your checklist of items when reporting death or hospitalization. Number five, signed consent forms. Number six, progress or treatment notes. They must be legible and include identification of the provider, which is also required by Rule 108.8. It states that if records are altered or modified, provide unaltered version as well. Include electronic or handwritten notes detailing the diagnosis and treatment rendered, medicines administered or prescribed, labels, sticky notes, and other notations. This is an example of what I've already advised. They want the incomplete record, everything that makes up that patient record. Number seven, radiographs must be diagnostic quality duplicates, no photocopies. In the event of digital radiographs, they must be submitted on digital media such as a CD, a flash drive, or by email. I have, in my experience, getting a digital a radiograph submitted can be very, very easy or it can be very, very complicated if it requires a special application or software. This is uh, something you'll just have to cross depending on your particular situation. I can tell you that each radiograph must indicate the date that the radiograph was taken as stated here on the checklist. Number eight, diagnostic images, imaging, or photographs. Identify the patient name and date for each image. Number nine, the patient account history, ledger, billing, insurance information, EOBs. Again, any financial information related to the patient that you have in your possession. Number 10, periodontal and restoration charting. I can tell you that on any and every patient, the board does expect there to be some notation and or periodontal charting with the chart as part of the Rule 108.8 .8 record keeping. Number 11, models, casts, or drawings, initial and final. Any and all casts, models, or drawings that you have available, and it's required for all orthodontia cases, uh, must be submitted to the board. If it's not convenient, then you can send photographs of these items and advise the board that they are available for inspection. Number 12, lab prescriptions. Number 13, drug prescriptions. Number 14, referral forms and letters. Number 15, correspondence. Again, all of these instructions are on the checklist and are self-explanatory. Moving on to page two of the checklist. Number 16, copies of schedule for all treatment dates. Identify all providers and all patients. 
It is important that if there is more than one treating doctor that all providers are notated and easily identifiable in the records. But they also want a separate schedule for all treatment dates to include the providers on those dates. Number 17, proof of current certification for CPR or ACLS certification, proof of those cards for all dentists, hygienists, and assistants involved in patient treatment. Again, this is something that's outside of what you would typically think would be part of a report on death or hospitalization, but it is required pursuant to this checklist. Number 18, a written emergency plan. A written emergency plan can be as simple as one page or it can be several pages. There are several available online. Hopefully you have already developed a written emergency plan and you have that as part of your office. You can certainly put one together to submit as part of this response and re report of hospitalization or death. But a written emergency plan to include the checklist of items and the procedures for handling office emergencies is required to be submitted as part of these reports. Proof of continuing education to include the CE completed within the preceding 24 months, including annual and specialty CE. And then finally, the narrative, which we discussed before, item number 20. It then gives you several blanks that if you did not submit any requested item 1 through 20 to the board, you can identify that item number and write out the reason why it was not completed. Whoever completes the form, if it's one or several people, would sign at the bottom and I would recommend printing their name as well and then dating to confirm that the checklist was used and who was in charge of providing the checklist and filling it out. They also give you uh, a copy of Rule 107.105, Collection of Information and Records. This is the law that authorizes the board to request records and also gives you the administrative and disciplinary and civil penalties for failure to comply with board requests. This is where the board is emphasizing that this is information that they are entitled to part of their job of handling complaints and investigations under Chapter 107, Dental Board Procedures, starting off with dental records. Upon request by board staff, a dental custodian of records shall provide copies of dental records or original records, and board staff may require a dental custodian records to submit records immediately if required by the urgency of the situation. Subpart B, response to board requests. In addition to the requirements of responding or reporting to the board under this section, a licensee or registrant shall respond in writing to all written board requests for information within 10 days of the receipt of such request. Uh, sometimes by request, uh, you can extend that time if necessary, but you will have to deal with the investigator and get their permission to extend that time. Subpart C, business records affidavits. Dental records must be provided under a business records affidavit or as otherwise required by board staff. And that's what gives the board the authority to require the records under a business records affidavit, the form for which they give you as well. And then finally, the uh, list of penalties for failure to comply are listed there as well. Moving on to the next page in the form packet. This is the form for the affidavit for dental records and business records. The affidavit for dental records and business records, what's very, very important on this particular form is two things, actually three. Uh, number one, each blank needs to be filled in correctly. And in parentheses, it tells you the information they are looking for. The second thing that is very, very important is in the middle of the page, 
starting with the sentence attached here to our blank pages. They're looking for the numbers of pages or the number of pages of the dental and business records. You're going to have to count each physical page and submit the correct number of pages in that blank. So I've seen it where doctors have submitted this form and not filled in the blank and the board will not accept it unless you sign off and it's notarized you signing off on the number of pages filled in in that blank yourself. They will not fill it in for you. And then lastly, the important thing is that it is notarized. A notary, you may have a notary in your office, you may have a notary next door. Typically notaries work in lawyers' offices and most uh, banks have notaries available for you at no cost. The next form in the packet is the Affidavit for Photographic Videography Recording Records. This is a separate affidavit, separate from the dental records and business records, but only for the photographic and videography recording records. It looks the same. The blanks are, are essentially the same. Again, fill it out correctly. Make sure you get the number of images correct in the blank. And then finally, signed off and notarized by the appropriate person. The next form is the affidavit for radiographic studies, a third affidavit that has to do with radiographic images only. Same instructions there, fill it out correctly, have it notarized, and in this one you're attaching and you're stating the accurate number of images of radiographic studies that are being submitted under this affidavit. Again, very, very straightforward. It is a legal document. You will want to get legal advice and counsel on the proper filling out of this affidavit and all three of these affidavits, especially in, in the instance where you're not sure or just want to make sure that you're doing it correctly. For many, many doctors, a self-report of hospitalization or death may be the first time in their entire licensure and their entire career that they've ever had to do anything in dealing with the dental board. Hopefully it's not because of patient death or hospitalization, but in that instance, you're going to want to make sure that you do it correctly given the nature of the, of the underlying cause to begin with you may be dealing with a, um, a sad situation. So getting this part of it correct uh, could not be more important. So the filling up out of these legal documents and submitting the legal document, which is your dental record, again, I emphasize, may require your obtaining legal counsel to do so. This concludes the review of the form. And on the next slide, uh, there will be um, information that will allow you to submit any questions that you may have that's been presented as part of this video back to us in the CE department. If you have any questions about this particular video presentation, you may send an email to the UTSD Continuing Education at uth.tmc.edu. This has been Dental Practice Risk Management through Regulatory Compliance Part 5, TSBDE Rule 108.6, Understanding How and When to Make a Report of Patient Death or Injury Requiring Hospitalization. The course reference where you can find the rules and regulations is at this web URL to go to the website for the Texas State Board of Dental Examiners. This completes dental practice risk management through regulatory compliance part five. Texas State Board of Dental Examiners Rule 108.6, Understanding How and When to Make a Report of Patient Death or Injury Requiring Hospitalization. It is now time for you to take a short exam in order to complete the requirements for streaming video courses.
due to the nature of our subject content, a passing score of 90% is necessary in order for you to pass the course. Upon a successful completion of this exam, you will be visually informed that you have met the requirements to proceed. If you fail to answer enough questions correctly, you will be instructed to take the exam and a new set of questions will be provided. You will have three chances to fulfill the requirements. If you are not successful, you will be instructed to review this section again. Good luck on the exam. If you are ready to take Dental Practice Risk Management through Regulatory Compliance Part 6, Texas State Board of Dental Examiners Rule 108.9, Understanding and Avoiding a Complaint for Dishonorable Conduct, upon the completion of this exam, you will be provided a link to continue. If you wish to proceed at a later date, you will need to log in and no further payment is necessary since this is a continuum.